Hey class, welcome to chapter three. It's all about interdependence in the gains from trade. So why is trade important? Well, we discussed it in chapter one and we're gonna kind of keep going over it, but interdependence does help us gain. Because remember, each economy has scarce resources. And within those scarce resources, each one of us has to allocate them accordingly. But with trade, even if we don't have a resource, we can trade elsewhere for it and maximize our usage interdependence that's what we really are talking about we're interdependent on each other if you look at this nice gentleman let's pretend he lives in kansas city he has some hair gel in his hair and it comes from cleveland ohio he has a cell phone it may come from taiwan it could come from china he has a dress shirt his dress shirt came from china it could come from indonesia it could come from mexico and he has some coffee that was produced in kenya or it's produced in colombia and that coffee drink also has some milk which could have been produced in wisconsin or could have been produced in um right outside of kansas city so we rely on people from around the world to give us the things that we like and we enjoy interdependence is the way that we look at this so remember i mentioned that, that one of the 10 principles from chapter one well that's one, one of those 10 principles we're going to talk about today is trade makes everyone better off. We're going to learn why people and nations choose to be interdependent and how they gain from that. We've got two countries. We've got the United States and we have Japan. They have two goods. Yeah, now I know. Obviously, an economy has more than two goods, but remember how we talked about Economists use models to make complicated processes simple so that they can basically examine them, and this is one of them. So we're only gonna have computers and wheat. We have only one source of labor, and we have one resource. And basically labor is measured in hours. So we're gonna look at these two economies, and we're gonna look at them if they choose to be self-sufficient, and if they choose to trade with each other. So in this economy, the U.S. has 50,000 hours of labor, and they've got that available for production. And it requires 100 hours of labor to produce one computer. It costs, requires 10 hours of labor to produce one ton of wheat. But remember, they only have 50,000, so they can't go beyond 50,000. So in A, you can see that we're looking at taking all of those resources and putting them towards computers. So that means there's nothing left for wheat. Now, knowing that there's 50,000, we now can decide what to do about production. So we know if we have 50,000 hours of labor and it takes 100 hours of labor to produce one computer, then 50,000 divided by 100 gives us 50 computers. And Zero hours allocated gives us zero hours of wheat. Now, what if we decide to not produce only computers, but to produce some wheat? So now we're in point B. Point B has us doing 40,000 hours towards computers, but we're gonna use 10 towards wheat. So we take the 40 and we divide it by the 100 and we get 400 and we take the 10,000 and we divide it by 10 and we get a thousand and we can do this for each one of the allocations So for instance, we can go 25 25, which is an even split We're gonna get 250 computers and a lot of wheat, right? We can decide ah, you know what computers are nice, but we want to eat So we're gonna do 10 and 40 and that means we're gonna end up with a hundred computers and 4,000 tons of wheat or we can decide, I don't care about computers, and I am going to go with only wheat, which means now I have a lot more wheat, but no computers. This translates, sorry, I need to clear. to the production possibilities curve. So remember we had, what did we have? We had 500 computers and no wheat. So now what are we saying? We're saying we're here in point A, 500 computers, zero wheat, point A. 
Now, if we have 400 computers right here, and we have 1,000 tons of wheat, we're at point B. If we're at 250 computers and 2,500 tons of wheat, we're at C. And then obviously, if we're at 100 and 4,000, and then here we have absolutely no computers and we only have wheat. This is the United States production possibilities curve, right? And right here, there's no trade. They're just here and they're doing it, right? So what if the United States decides that they wanna trade? Well, we gotta look at Japan first. So here's what it's gonna look like. Any combination, and I just picked some of the combinations. Remember we had A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever. But any combination will work. So without trade, they're stuck. They have to stay on this line, right? We could produce half of our labor, and we could produce um, two goods. So we could say, half of you over there, you are all going to make computers. And half of you over here, you're going to make wheat. Split up my labor. So what, is, what, what do we end up with? We know that for a fact, because we calculated it. We end up with 250 computers and 25,000 tons of wheat, no trade. The country could have to survive on this because that's all they have. Now let's derive Japan's using the same thing we just learned by deriving the United States. In Japan's, we're gonna find out that they have 30,000 hours of labor available. Now, producing computers costs them 125 hours of labor, and producing a ton of wheat requires 25 hours of labor. We're gonna graph this. So, given what we learned, we need to calculate all the in-between points. So what we're going to do is we're gonna look at it when calculate two points and then assume a straight line. So, if they used all their labor to produce computers, then they would end up with all their labor, 30,000, divided by 125, which is how, much, how many hours per computer, and they would end up with 240 computers. So you can put this one down here. Then you can do the same thing for wheat. And what you can do is you can say, okay, all 300, I mean, sorry, 30,000, out labor hours were dedicated to wheat, 25 hours per wheat. That means they get 1,200 right here. If you have these two points and we're assuming that if there is a one-to-one -one relationship or a linear relationship, you can basically draw a straight line, preferably straighter than that, and any combination along here is viable. Maybe. So without trade, if they were to allocate their resources just as we did, and they were to allocate them 50-50, then they would end up with half their labor going towards computers, and they'd end up with 120 computers, and half their labor going towards wheat, and they'd end up with 600 tons of wheat. So without any trade, we're going to end up with the U.S. having 250 computers and 2,500 tons of wheat. And the Japanese consumers, if they allocate their resources half and half, would have 120 computers and 600 tons of wheat. So we can start to compare the consumption before and after trade. So suppose the U.S. produces 340 tons of wheat. How many computers would they be able to produce with the remaining labor? And what if the US, if Japan decided to produce a lot more computers, how many tons of wheat would they have remaining? So back to the US again. Now we're going to say, okay, the US is going to produce 3,400 tons of wheat 
and that's going to require 34,000 labor hours. So that means that there's a remaining, well, we know, 550,000 divided by 34,000 gets you 16,000 are left over to produce computers. And we know it's 100 hours per computer, so that gives us 160 computers. So here is the analogy if the United States decided to do this. If Japan decided to produce 140 computers, well, unfortunately, that means that they are going to only produce computers. Maybe, or maybe not. If this economy had no trade, this would be a problem because what are they missing? Wheat, which means they can't eat. But if they have trade, this may be just fine. So what is trade? Well, trade is exports and imports. Exports are when things exit. So goods produced domestically and sold abroad are exiting the country, they're exports. Goods produced abroad and coming into the United States to be sold domestically are imports. They're entering, they're in, they're coming in. So here's a little brain teaser on exports and imports. Somebody in Germany or South Korea, doesn't matter, this is Las Vegas and they spend $200 on a pair of tickets to a show. How do we classify this? And other expenditures by foreign tourists while they're here in the US. Think about it a second. Well, believe it or not, it's an export. It doesn't matter where the item is consumed. It matters where it's produced and who it's sold to. So in this case, it was produced here, Las Vegas, and it was sold to a foreign buyer. It exported. So the precise definition of exports is a little bit stricter. Um, it has to do with the fact that the goods and services produced here and purchased by foreign buyers. The reason why we don't usually use that is because it gets confusing because who's foreign, who's not foreign. And this is a stricter definition of exports and imports. So it's a little brain teaser. Kind of fun. So, consumption under trade. Okay, we're gonna get better off now. So suppose the United States exports 70 tons of wheat to Japan and imports 110 computers from Japan. Now remember, we already created the United States and Japan's production possibility curve if they were to produce in a kind of an even. Remember, Japan's only gonna produce computers. The United States is gonna produce quite a bit of wheat and a few computers. So that means that Japan, if the United States exports it, and the only trading partner they happen to have in this case is Japan, that means that if we export to the United States 70 tons of wheat to Japan, then Japan imports seven, I'm sorry, 700 tons of wheat. And then vice versa. If Japan imports, if we import 110 computers from Japan, then Japan exports. 110 computers. So how much of this good is consumed in the US? And what does this do to our production possibilities curve? Ah, yes. And then how much of this good, each good is, is consumed in Japan? And where are they gonna be? Okay, so remember the US was originally, what are we doing? We were right here, right? We had 34,000 tons of wheat, and we were doing what? We were producing 160 computers. Now, what we've decided is we're going to produce slightly more wheat, and we're going to import some computers. So what does this mean? Okay, so what this means is, is that we started at 3,400 right here, right? This line right here. And what we did was we exported a portion of it. We exported the difference between here and here, which is 700. And that went out. In turn, because we did that, we were able to then import into the country what? 
110 computers. So we went from 160 to this number here, which is 270. So now what's happened is even though we have produced, we're choosing less wheat, we're going to have less wheat in the country because we, this part became an export and went out. Goodbye. We brought in this many computers. So our curve is now out here. Now, if you remember from the production possibilities curve earlier, that point is unobtainable without trade or technology. So in this case, trade has made this country move its production possibilities curve outside because they are now trading. So, everybody see where we are? Now, what's going to happen to Japan? Okay, now Japan is on another situation. They're over here, correct? They produced only computers. They're over here. So they produced 240 computers. They're going to export 110. So the difference between these two points is things going out of Japan, correct? Now, they had absolutely no wheat, but we're going to import in 700 tons of wheat right here. So they're gonna bring that into the country. So now all of a sudden, they're gonna take that 700 and bring it over and look, even with the export, they're still, what, better off than they were before. What do you guys think? Is it making any sense? So, basically, to look at this on a mathematical perspective, we kind of looked at it on the graph. Now we're going to look at it mathematically. Without trade, we can make 25, I'm sorry, 250 computers and 2,500 wheat. And then with trade, now we have 270 and 2,700 wheat. Sorry about that. Um, all of a sudden there was a little noise in the background. So if you take where we would have been without trade, which was what we looked at before, remember the chart that we looked at before everything started? And then we looked at the chart that we have now. The gains from trade are the difference between these two. So we went from 270 to 200. We went to 270 from 250. So our gains from trade is 20. We went from 2,700 now, away from 25, where we were before, our gains are 200. So we literally are this much better off than we were before. Japan has exactly the same thing. Without trade, they were going to be doing wheat and computers. With trade, they can actually produce more computers and end up with more computers in general and end up with more wheat than they did before. They're going to gain as well. So where do these advantages come from? It's called absolute advantage. That's the word advantage. The ability to produce a good using fewer inputs than another producer. In this case, the input is labor. So the United States has absolute advantage in wheat. They can produce a ton of wheat using 10 hours of labor. Japan, it took 25. Thus, when you look at the numbers, you start to see that 10 is smaller than 25. The United States has absolute advantage in wheat. If each country has an absolute advantage in one good and specializes in that good, both countries can gain from trade. So in our particular case, Japan had absolute advantage in computers. 
the United States has the absolute advantage in wheat. It doesn't mean that the country has to only produce one thing. For instance, as you notice in the US example, the US still produced some computers, even though they did move towards producing mostly wheat. Usually this is a case in which by doing so, they end up maximizing the resources that they have left. And sometimes those resources are literally better off than they would have been before. So sometimes some of the resources may not be as efficient as others. So they keep the most efficient and they get rid of the least efficient. And that's how you end up with that. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean by that is the United States may have a lot of computer producers and it may take quite a few labor hours if they produce, if they all are producing because when you average it out, but there may be a few that are really efficient and those may stay in business and they may keep those in the United States and then the rest they may import it. So the parable of two modern economies. So we have meat and we have potatoes. Sounds pretty Midwestern, doesn't it? There's only two people in this economy. There's a cattle rancher named Rose and there is a potato farmer named Frank. They both like to eat meat and potatoes. So if Rose produces only meat and Frank produces only potatoes, they both can gain from trade. And this gets us to their production possibilities curves, which is what? It's showing all the combinations an economy has. So in this particular case, we're looking at hours and minutes. So in this particular case, Frank, to make one ounce of meat, it takes him 60 minutes. For Rose, it takes her 20 minutes. Now, here's potatoes. It takes Frank 15 minutes to make one ounce of potatoes, and it takes Rose 10. Now, that means if you translate that into eight hours, if it's one ounce for every minute for for every 60 minutes for Frank, then he only produces eight ounces in eight hours. For Rose, clearly that's gonna be slightly different and she ends up getting 24 ounces of meat. Taking those same amount of eight hours and looking at potatoes, if it's 15 minutes for one ounce, then he can get 32 Frank in eight hours. And for Rose, it's 10 minutes so she can get 48. So here, or what we're going to do next. We're going to look at the production opportunities available, right? So if there was no trade and Frank lived all by himself, if he only produced meat and he didn't trade, he could produce eight ounces of meat. Okay. If Frank produced only potatoes, he can produce what? 32 ounces of potatoes. So clearly because he likes meat and potatoes, he's probably gonna pick somewhere in the middle. So he's gonna probably say half my time I'm gonna do meat and half my time I'm gonna do potatoes and I'm gonna to come to this beautiful point A. Now if there's no trade, Rose in the same amount of time could produce only meat and produce 24, produce only potatoes and produce 48, or she can choose to go 50-50 and do 12 and 24 and get to 4B, okay. So this is how, if they want both meat and potatoes, they can get meat and potatoes. Economies don't have to have the ability not to get it to trade. They just need to decide that trade makes them better off. So what if they specialized? So what if Frank specialized in growing potatoes? and spent more time growing potatoes? And what if he spent less time raising cattle? And Rancher Rose specialized in raising cattle. Spent more time raising cattle and less time growing potatoes. And they were able to trade five ounces of meat for 15 ounces of potatoes. So what ends up happening? So back to our little curve before, without trade, where was Frank? He was right here in point A. But with trade, he can actually 
trade away some of his potatoes, I mean, I'm sorry, trade away some of his potatoes because he's producing only potatoes, right? So what he, what he does is he produces 32 ounces of potatoes and he keeps 17 for himself. So he ends up trading away the rest and he gives that over to Rose. And in turn, Rose says, okay, I'm gonna produce 18 and I'm gonna trade away some to Frank. So what ends up happening? Both of them are better off than they were before because both of them are outside the curve. Before they were, had to stay inside the curve, they had no choice. Now they can move to the other side and actually be on the outside of the curve. So, without trade, Frank was going to produce what? He was going to produce 24 ounces of meat and 16 of uh, potatoes. And Rose was going to produce 12 and 24. So now Frank is not going to produce any meat, and he's going to produce potatoes. So, what's going to happen is he's going to basically take the difference between here and here. And he's going to give away part of it, 15. So 15, he's going to give over to Rose. And in turn, Rose is going to give him five ounces of meat. Okay, so by doing so, what's happened? So, Frank started off, and where was he? He had 12, he had, I'm sorry, he had 10 ounces of um, meat, and he was going to produce none now. And he had 16 ounces of potatoes, and he's going to produce 32. He's going to get 15 ounces of those potatoes away. So now he's going to have 16 minus, I'm sorry, 6, 32 minus 15 is 17, right? He did 32 ounces of potatoes. He's going to give away 15 of them. So he's going to be left with 17. Wait a second, before he could only get 16. He produced only potatoes, 32. He gave away 15 of them, and he still was better off. He had one ounce of potatoes more than he would have had before. The same thing is true for me. He could only produce, at the best case scenario, if he split his time, the best he could do was produce four ounces of meat. Now, he doesn't produce any meat. It's rid of those nasty cattle and he's gonna get five. So he's gonna be one ounce better off for me and one ounce better off for potatoes. Let's see what happens with Rose. Okay, so Rose before was producing 12 ounces of meat and 24 ounces of potato. So with trade, she's going to produce a lot more meat, 18. She's gonna produce a little bit of potatoes because Rose has a bigger farm. Maybe she's got a little area that she can't really use for cattle. She decided to use it for potatoes. This is something that happens a lot with trade. It doesn't mean that you just give up on doing something. You just don't do it all. So what happens here is, is that Rose takes her 18, gives five away, gives them to Frank. Now she has, wait, she produces 18, gives five. She has 13 ounces of meat, which before she only had 12. She's actually better off. The same thing with the potatoes in some ways because she used to produce 24. Now she's producing 12. Frank's giving her 15 for that meat. So now she has 27. She's, she has a lot, she has three ounces more potatoes than she did before. Trade has made both of them better off than they were before. Absolute advantage, remember we talked about that? Absolute advantage is what? When you can produce something at fewer inputs than another producer, okay. Rose can produce meat and fewer inputs. It took her only, what? 20 minutes to produce an ounce of meat. It took Ralph almost an hour. She also has absolute advantage in producing potatoes. It only takes her 10 minutes, where it takes Frank 15. So even though she has absolute advantage in both, trade still makes sense.
because of opportunity costs. And this has to do with comparative advantage. So one of the things that people always assume is, well, if I have absolute advantage, that's what I should train. But sometimes you can have absolute advantage in multiple things, but still you need to look at the opportunity cost between producing something and trading for it. So an opportunity cost, if you remember, is what you give up to obtain an item. And it measures a trade-off between two goods that each producer faces. So for instance, for every ounce of meat that Frank produced, produced, he gave up four ounces of potatoes. For Rose, for every ounce of meat she produced, she gave up two ounces of potatoes. So the opportunity cost for one ounce of potato is a fourth of an ounce of meat for Frank and a half an ounce of meat for Rose. So even though Rose is much more efficient at producing potatoes than Frank, Frank gives up far less meat to produce potatoes than Rose does. So why does Japan specialize in computers? Why do both countries gain from trade? Both countries gain from trade because they specialize in the producing goods at low, the lowest cost. Absolute advantage measures the cost of the good in terms of the inputs required to produce it. So remember, it's literally just another measure of opportunity cost. So in our example, the opportunity cost of a computer is the amount of wheat that could have been produced using the labor that was used to produce that one computer. So in theory, you're giving up wheat to produce a computer. The second best alternative. Producing the computer you decided to do, your second best alternative in this case is wheat. So when you look at the comparative advantage, you start to say to yourself, okay, how does this work? So the opportunity cost of a computer is 10 tons of wheat in the United States. So one produ producing one computer, producing one computer requires 100 labor hours, which instead could produce 10 tons of wheat. Five tons of wheat in Japan, well, if you want to produce a computer, it costs you 125 labor hours. Well, instead, you could use that 125 labor hours and produce five tons of wheat. So one computer in Japan is five tons a week. One computer in the United States is 10 tons a week. So Japan has comparative advantage for computers. Remember our friend Rose? Absolute advantage does not necessarily mean comparative advantage. So you can have absolute advantage and not have comparative advantage. You can have comparative advantage and not have absolute advantage. So absolute advantage. In wheat, the US has an absolute advantage in wheat. They can produce a ton using 10 labor hours. It costs Japan 25. In producing computers, it costs Japan 125 and only the US only 10. In theory, the US has absolute advantage in both, right? They can produce both at less inputs. But we just looked at that, and that was not necessarily true for comparative advantage. So even though the United States has absolute advantage in both, they only had comparative advantage in wheat because it's what you give up. So trade arises because you have this ability to look at comparative advantage, the difference in opportunity costs. And if each country specializes in goods, which they have comparative advantage, the production of every country is higher than it would be if they were by themselves. And what happens is the economic pie grows. If you even think of just Rose and Frank, there's more meat and more potatoes now in that little economy than there was before they traded. So countries gain from trade. I'm sorry, I already even did that. So absolute and comparative advantage. Let's take a look here. So we have Argentina and Brazil, and they have one, they have 10,000 hours of labor per month. In Argentina, they can do one pound of coffee requires two hours. And producing one bottle of wine requires 
four hours. In Brazil, one pound of coffee requires one hour. One bottle of wine requires five hours. Anybody notice anything funky already? So which country has absolute advantage in producing coffee? Which country has a comparative advantage? Okay, so the easiest way to do this is to do yourself up a little grid, but some of you can do it in your head. It just depends on who you are. So the usual way to do this is hours needed to produce coffee. Argentina, two hours. Brazil, one. Produce a bottle of wine. Argentina, five. Brazil, I'm sorry, Argentina, four. Brazil, five. Okay. Opportunity cost. Well, if it's basically the bottle of wine is basically two pounds of coffee because if each pound of coffee takes an hour, two hours, and it takes four hours to do a wine, then it's going to be two pounds of coffee for one bottle of wine. In the case of Brazil, it's five because it takes five hours for one bottle of wine where it takes only one hour for one pound then the opportunity cost in terms of a pound of coffee is half a bottle of wine. Because if you look at it in this case, it's only, it's half the amount of time to produce a thing of coffee as it is for wine. And in the case of Brazil, it's one fifth. Now you can do this over 10 hours and you can basically, I mean, I'm sorry, eight hour day and you can say, okay, well in an eight hour day, if it takes two hours to produce each pound, then in an eight hour day, you can produce four pounds. In Brazil, you can basically produce eight pounds. If it takes four hours to produce one bottle of wine, you're only gonna get two bottles per eight hours. And in Brazil, you're gonna get, if it's five hours, you're not gonna get even two bottles. You're gonna get one and three eighths bottles of wine. So which country has absolute advantage in producing coffee? Brazil. One pound of coffee requires only one hour of labor. But in Argentina, it requires two. Which country has the absolute advantage in producing wine? Well, believe it or not, Argentina, because its opportunity cost of produce, I'm mean, sorry, compare it. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. That slide is messed up. So let's go back and take a look and see what we were looking at. So we didn't answer the absolute advantage question, did we? Wine, let's take a look. It requires four hours for Argentina to produce a bottle of wine and five for Brazil, who has absolute advantage. Argentina, okay. Always good to answer all the questions, correct? Comparative advantage in wine. Okay, the opportunity cost of a bottle of wine is two pounds of coffee because it's four hours are required. And so we figured that out. So to produce a bottle of wine, you could produce two pounds of coffee. So in this particular case, Argentina has comparative advantage in wine. Brazil's opportunity cost in wine is five pounds of coffee. So it is actually more costly for Brazil. Which means, guess what? If you looked at it, you find it out that Brazil has comparative advantage in coffee. So, a person or a country can have absolute advantage in both goods. We found that out with the United States, didn't we? They cannot have comparative advantage in goods. If you find one country has comparative advantage in one, chances are the other country, well, the other country is going to have it. And it's due to the fact that they will have different opportunity costs. So one person or one country has comparative advantage in only one good. And the other person has the comparative advantage in the other good. So let's take a look at Tom Brady and mowing his lawn. Uh-oh, he's wearing a Patriots outfit. We know he no longer is a Patriot. In two hours, he can mow his lawn. Or he can film a TV commercial for, what, $20,000. Yeah, we wish. Maybe make it $20 million. Forrest Gump, in four hours, can mow Tom Brady's ground yard, or he can work at McDonald's. What is this saying to us? Okay, 
it takes two hours for Tom Brady to mow his lawn. His opportunity cost or his comparative advantage is in that same two hours, he could earn $20,000. Forrest Gump, in that same four hours, could earn what? $40. So even though it takes Forrest Gump longer to mow the lawn, Forrest Gump, it costs Forrest Gump less to mow that lawn, right? He's going to lose less. So he has what? Comparative advantage. Clearly Tom Brady has absolute advantage in both TV commercials and mowing lawns, correct? So to summarize, trade benefits everyone in society. It allows people to specialize. The price of trade, it lies between those two opportunity costs. Because if you think about those opportunity costs are kind of measuring the price, aren't they? How much wine you're giving up, how much coffee you're giving up, how much cattle you're giving up, how much potatoes you're giving up, how much, um, how many computers, how much wheat. So the principle of comparative advantage explains why interdependence works so well and why we have gains in trade. This is a video I'd like you to watch. I am going to put this link separately and it does really wrap it up. Okay, um, I will put it as a separate link and you can take a look at it. So we have some unanswered questions here. We made a lot of assumptions. We made assumptions about the quantities of each good and how it's produced, how, who trades it, how it's consumed, the price the country's trade. There was no price in any of this, was it? It was just price comparatively speaking to inputs. In the real world, obviously, quantities and price would help determine consumer preferences, which is where we're going to start looking at supply and demand. But when you start to look at what it is you give up to trade something, comparative advantage and absolute advantage are key. And the goal really of looking at trade and to look at comparative advantage and absolute advantage, absolute advantage is, is the minimal amount of inputs. Comparative advantage is comparing one against the other to see how much you give up of one to produce the other. You can see how trade really does make countries better off and takes them off of their production possibilities curves that they're stuck on by themselves and moves them outside the production possibilities curve. So to summarize, in case you've forgotten, trade and independence allows everybody to have a greater quantity of goods and better quality. All right, that is it for the today. What I'd like to say is that we please watch that video. That video is really important. Um, it does sum everything up and it's kind of a different perspective than my own. If you have any questions, please give me a call um, or email me and I will talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.